Welcome everybody to the conformance overview. Uh, my name is Chris Edwards. I'm one of the two leads of the conformance verification matrix subcommittee. Uh, Robert Daniels is my co-lead. He's the one running the slides. You can say hello, Robert. Make sure your comms working. Yeah, yeah no, I, uh, hello, I was trying to find my mute button. So um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this meeting is uh, is to give everybody an overview of the face conformance program um, and the related processes, basically for people who want to use it. Um, we've targeted this toward basically the software suppliers who want to know more about conformance and the people who want to be verification authorities. Um, the meeting started out as a so you want to be a VA meeting, and we had a lot of people coming in that were software suppliers. Uh, asking questions um, and we found that more often when we were in that meeting we were talking to suppliers and having more of a formal uh, informal discussion about conformance than we were actually addressing the how to be a VA so that's the evolution of the meeting where we're at today so um, we're basically going to do this as a lead discussion uh, we do have a slide deck that's got a lot of slides in it we're going to go through a bunch of those um, but we're encouraging participation and uh, we might jump down to some slides, which we don't necessarily intend to cover unless people ask those questions. Um, there are more slides in this deck than we could cover in, uh, in the period that we have, uh, particularly because mostly what we want to do is answer the questions for the people who are on the call. Um, next slide. So the presenters in this meeting, um, I'm going to be the one doing probably half the talking. Um, Robert Daniels uh, is, uh, as I said, my TWG co-chair. Um, usually we have members of the BWG operations. Um, I see a few of them on the line. Um, there's uh, members of the VACOP. Uh, Stephen Price, who you heard earlier, is uh, probably going to be the most vocal of that group. Um, we may have people from Getting Started and Face Outreach uh, speak up on some topics. And then, of course, uh, we may have some suppliers who've completed its conformance that may have things to say. Um, so if you're any one of those people and you're in this meeting, please, you know, if you have something to say, uh, raise your hand. Um, when we get to the, uh, the next slide, we've got, uh, go ahead, Robert, next slide. Sorry. Um, so if you have a question, um, there might be times when I will ask, you know, and I'll get to this in, in just the next slide, you know, show of hands. So if you know how to use the show of hand feature in WebEx, uh, kind of get used to it, um, we may be um, asking a couple of questions just to get a, kind of a poll. If we were doing it in front of a live audience, this would be a whole lot easier, and uh, that's the way we prefer to do this. Um, but uh, we're adjusting to our WebEx virtual world. Um, if you have a question to ask, uh, use the chat feature in WebEx. Um, somebody, probably Robert, will read that question, and uh, anybody who's on the call who wants to say something about it could raise their hand, and then we could go into that conversation. Uh, there's going to be times when I will delay a conversation because we have slides that are going to come up about that, uh, and then there's going to be other times when we'll just jump down to a slide deck area that will address that question. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And we'll go through the quick, you know, how many people on this call are new to the consortium? And we'll practice raising our hands. Is there nobody? Oh, we got you probably uh, can't three. see them because you're oh, not the fine. host. I can't see them. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Robert no, I'll, can. I'll, I'll, I'll reveal the results. It's about four or five uh, that are new to the consortium. Okay. And, and do we have anybody so on the call that wants to be a VA? We have one that one or two that may want to become a VA. Is that or their still hand is still raised from the last question? Okay. And um, if there's anything in particular you want out of this meeting, just um, post it in the chat. Uh, we don't necessarily need to go through it right now, but if you get something, some question popping up, or if you have some idea right now, um, go ahead and type that in. Um, the information that we're gathering from the people who are attending the meeting, that's going to guide what parts of the, of the topic we cover. Um, we've got about the first 20 slides that we're going to go through anyway. 
Um, that can be about a half hour to 45 minutes worth of stuff, uh, depending on how many other conversations we get into. Um, frequently, we get a lot of uh, conversations that will extend that to about an hour and a half uh, when we start getting into some of the details on things. So, um, and then there's also the, do you want to be a VA piece? Um, which, since we have people who may be interested in that, um, we'll cover that at the end. Okay, so with that, um, so the face conformance program, the first piece, um, conformance is to UOCs, not systems. Um, one of the goals of the face technical standard is to promote uh, portable, reusable software components. So conformance to face is that making those portable, reusable software components. Uh, we don't have conformance to a system that uses those components, just a system that is made of conformant uh, uh, components. Um, conformance is to the face technical standard. Uh, there have been several editions uh, released uh, so far. Oh, there's another slide we needed to be update. Uh, 3.1 is the most recent uh, standard that's out there. Um, the conformance program allows for conformance to any valid published edition of the standard. So yes, right now it's possible that somebody could come in and say, I want to prove I'm conformant to face uh, technical standard edition 1.0. Um, oh, I think I missed one of my bullets in my earlier slides. Um, this meeting is going to be about the state of things today. So while there may be movement to try to um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, to deprecate the FACE 1.0 standard. Um, we haven't done that yet, so I'm going to talk about what the current state is. Um, we may get into some other side conversations where we want to talk about things that are going on currently, um, but we're going to focus what the current state of conformance is uh, when we talk about uh, things in this meeting. Um, so, as I was saying, conformance is to any uh, any valid published edition, and there is an approved correction process that provides a path to conformance for editions with known problems. So if we look at tech standard 1.0, um, everybody who's been at the consortium for a while actually knows that uh, you do conformance to 1.1 for 1.0. I actually don't know that we have an approved correction out there for that because it's so old. Um, but we do have approved corrections out for edition 2.1.1. Um, if there's problems with you meeting that, uh, there's a long list of those. Uh, and there's also uh, some approved corrections for 3.0. I don't think we have any for 3.1 yet because it's so new. Uh, but then I might be out of date on that. Um, let's go to the next slide. So you may have seen this slide in the uh, business overview, um, but basically we look at conformance as being four steps. Um, there's a preparation step that the supplier does basically to get ready for conformance. Um, there's a verification step, which the face verification authority uh, proves or v verifies that the uh, software uh, unit of conformance is, is uh, meeting the technical standard. Um, then there is the conformance step, or certification step, sorry, and then the registration step. Uh, generally speaking, the uh, certification step is very basic. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't require a lot of uh, more information than you go to the certification authority, you get your certificate. And the registration step is also a very simple uh, go to the registry and, um, and report your certificates there and update your information about the product that you've now listed in the registry. Um, this meeting is generally going to be focusing on the preparation and verification steps. Um, let's go through um, a couple more slides and then we'll pause for questions. Um, conformance definitions, uh, a unit of conformance is basically the thing you're going to push through uh, the conformance process. Um, generally, that's a piece of software that fits within a segment. Um, but it can also be a uh, domain-specific data model. Um, so it doesn't actually have to be executable software. Uh, face conformance is, is meeting 100% of the requirements for a UOC. So a UOC cannot be conformant unless it meets all of the requirements placed upon a unit of conformance that meets its boundaries according to the face technical standard. Um, 
we talked about the face technical standard. It's it's the document that uh, has the technical requirements. Um, the face registry is a public listing of face conformant products. It is not a place to get face conformance products. It's a place to find conformant products. Uh, the software verification package is the um, the stuff that the supplier will provide to the verification authority to prove conformance. And that verification package has limitations, which we're going to discuss in a little bit. Uh, and then claiming face conformance, one of the primary notes we have here is that you cannot publicly say you're face conformant unless you have meet, unless you have actually completed conformance and have your product listed in the registry. Uh, that's one of the key points of uh, the conformance program, and it's part of the, the brand of the FACE uh, consortium. So FACE conformance requires being listed in the registry or to tell people that you are FACE conformant and publicly. Um, I think that's a good spot to stop and ask if there's any questions so far. Chris, we have one question about CTS, but I think we'll address that later. Okay. So let's go to um, the next slide is on the uh, participants of the conformance process. And really this is um, kind of terms. Uh, the software supplier is the term we use for the person who's providing the UOC, uh, even if it's a data model. Um, the face verification authority is one of many uh, entities that have been approved to uh, verify things for conformance. Um, the verification authority performs a technical evaluation of the product. Um, the face certification authority is the one and only entity approved by the uh, consortium to provide certificates to uh, conformer products. Uh, the face library administrator uh, maintains the um, face registry and the workflow tools um, the PRCR process and various other things that you use to interface uh, with uh, the FACE ecosystem. Um, the FACE consortium and its role in conformance is that it uh, creates and updates the technical standard and the rules for FACE conformance and it, uh, it also executes the PRCR process. Uh, the FACE steering committee approves VAs, appoints the CA and the LA, uh, it'll handle audits if needed, and uh, the appeals when requested. So uh, those are the roles and how they fit within the conformance process. So let's go into a little bit more detail on the face verification authority. Um, so verification is handled through the VA. Um, the VA is a technical expert on the technical standard and the verification process. They are approved by the consortium steering committee. Uh, they serve as the technical evaluator of conformance to the technical standard. So um, the VA evaluates that, those software products uh, through a test execution, and then they do an inspection of artifacts that, uh, for the requirements that are beyond what the CTS can test. Uh, and those VA personnel have to be experts on all editions of the technical standard in order to become approved. Um, these verification authority, they're basically the last line of uh, technical evaluation for conformant products. Uh, so they really represent that end of uh, the FACE consortium. Um, so there are multiple VAs uh, approved by the steering committee right now. Um, VA organizations do not have to be members of the FACE consortium at this time. Um, they can be government. Uh, we've got both a, uh, an Army and a Navy VA right now currently approved. Um, they can be internal organizations within a larger company, like um, a big company that has its own uh, SQE department. You could get your SQE department uh, uh, approved as a VA. We don't have anybody who's done that yet. Uh, and then we have independent companies right now We've got uh, Tucson Embedded Systems and Scient as uh, independent VAs that uh, suppliers can go through to, um, to get their software verified. The list of current VA organizations is available on the FACE landing page. So I'm gonna ask uh, 
Robert, Steve, if I've missed anything so far? Well, I'll I take a sip so. of water. Oh, no, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so either. Okay. Yeah, the, the only thing I, I, and I may have missed this, is you were talking about um, when you can say your face conformant. And it's true what you said. That's when you can say it publicly. But you are allowed to um, privately say some things, and I don't know if we covered that. No, we didn't. And usually we get a question on that. Um, so I know that if we were in a meeting room and nobody knew we were being recorded, that uh, we'd get a lot more feedback and people would raise their hands and say, hey, you know, what's this mean? And that whole public uh, announcement of conformance, um, that is something we usually get a question on. So yeah, Steve, thanks for bringing it up. Um, you can uh, go through the conformance program, have your conformance certificate and not publicly list it. And uh, if you're telling somebody in particular about your product and not posting it where everybody can see it, you can say you've got a conformance certificate. Okay, so um, on this slide, the top two do's in preparation. So when you're a supplier and you're trying to go through, uh, prepare your product for conformance, um, you want to establish your relationship with your verification authority fairly early. Um, this is the same as uh, a lot of other processes where you, if you have somebody who's evaluating your product for quality, evaluating your product for airworthiness, um, the sooner you talk to somebody about uh, what they're expecting from you and uh, what your hiccups might be in trying to go through conformance, um, the sooner you talk to your VA, the more likely you're going to be successful and meet your schedule. Um, you do want to prepare a preliminary software supplier statement of conformance. Um, go through that document, look at what's in it, understand what's there, and uh, it'll help you guide where you're supposed to be in the technical standard and help you figure out exactly which requirements you're supposed to be meeting. Um, figure out which technical standard you're using. Uh, find a shared data model you're going to be using for those data modeling uh, parts, which you are most likely going to need to do. Um, filter down the CVM for that standard and understand which requirements you need to do and um, how you're going to approach proving that you met them. Um, then you're going to want to develop your data model uh, and um, regularly run the conformance test suite uh, while your software is being developed. Um, running the conformance test suite will help you find uh, all of the um, little gotchas uh, with compiling to the gold standard library and, uh, and getting it to link correctly. Yes, this is Ron. Could I add a little there? Yes, you can. Uh, you, you mentioned the VA relationship and establishing that early. And, and that is probably the most critical thing that you can do to successfully get through conformance. And, and I wanted to just talk a little bit about that relationship. Uh, I, the VA is not like an IRS audit. We're, we're there to help you achieve your goal of gaining certification. So we, we will work with you to help you do that. We'll provide mentoring. We'll, we'll do a lot of things that can help you along the way. We're not there just to check off check marks at the end and give you a grade. It is an actual cooperative process where we help you achieve your goals. Thanks, Ron. Uh, all right, let's go into the next slide. Um, so, <laughs> real, quick, real quickly, Chris, um, we've got a couple questions that I think we uh, get to address right now. Uh, so we have a question about the uh, software supplier statement of conformance um, and, uh, you know, how is that uh, made in conjunction with the VA and the supplier? Okay, so um, the software supplier statement of conformance is a, is a document. It's really a form that's published by the FACE Consortium um, that outlines what aspects of the technical standard apply to your software. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the software supplier should make an attempt at filling it out. And um, Robert, we could probably just drop down to those slides real quick and just come back to slide 13 later. 
Um, <laughs> the um, so the uh, software supplier will fill this out and then show it to the VA, and the VA can help them through it. Um, the first section is uh, is basically you know who are you as a supplier, what kind of a product are you putting out, but then it gets into um, um, so basically, section one is just who are you. You go to the, the section two, um, which is on the next slide. Uh, you know, what's your unit of conformance? Do you have a variance associated with it? Um, section three is is uh, a little bit more detail on how the technical standard applies to you, um, which segment are you in, that kind of stuff. Section four. Uh, this gets into how you're um, how you're building the conformance test environment. You know which test suite version are you using, uh, which shared data model version. A couple of questions there, and then section five is really a listing of all of the uh, optional uh, conditional um, requirements within the technical standard and how they apply to your unit of conformance. So to fill this out, uh, the supplier should take their crack at it and then show it to the VA and the VA should go and help them make sure that that's correct. That's something to do very early. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, I think it does. Um, um, so while I go back to the previous slide, another question I think would be good to, good to answer, um, and that is you'd mentioned a VA within an organization. Um, and then, so the question is, how is, is that VA accepted or approved? Or how could that happen? You know, what are the rules? Or and and I think we could probably talk more generally about that now, and and move yeah. more specifically later for the VAs. Yeah. So uh, in general, um, VAs are approved by organization, not individuals. So um, in order for a larger organization to have a sub organization within. Uh, to be approved as a VA, you have to show independence in that sub-organization. Um, and then anybody who reports within that organization as a VA could function in that role. And yes, there's a lot more detail on that, on the do you want to be a VA section, which we'll be addressing at the end of the meeting. Okay. Uh, one, one last question, since we're kind of on this EA or the VA and, and prep. Um, can we talk about how the VAs interact with the CTS or the expectations of the CTS between the supplier and the VA? Okay, so um, as we said, the CTS, even on this slide uh, 12 here, regularly run the CTS. The supplier should download the CTS. Um, the CTS has, has the uh, gold standard libraries in it, which you'll have to compile your code against. Um, so really the supplier has to have the CTS and run the CTS. Um, when the supplier hands over their verification package to the VA, part of that verification package is going to be the test suite configuration, potentially, um, and any notes they've made about configuring the CTS. But the VA themselves is going to download the CTS. Um, they're gonna take the approved version of the CTS, they're gonna configure it themselves, and then they're gonna execute likely the same situation that the supplier did just to provide an independent review um, and see what the results are. Um, and of course, the VA is gonna be more of an expert on the CTS and will be able to, um, to look at those results in, uh, in more of a expert view. Um, ideally, the test suite just says pass and there's no problem. Um, but, you know, there are a number of CRs that are against the CTS, so always go back and check the uh, PRCR tool for approved corrections regarding to whichever version you're going against. Uh, make sure you're using the latest version of the CTS. And, of course, the VA is also going to know a lot about those PRs. Thanks, Chris. Uh, now, I think now we can go. Okay. Yeah, for the, the process of being a VA, I just saw that come up. Um, we're definitely addressing that later. Um, okay, so uh, this is the OV5B for the verification process. Um, it's really simple. Um, there's a, uh, so the supplier downloads 
off of the uh, repository, the face reference repository, the standard, all the tools, everything they need. They do their preparation. When they're ready, they send the verification package over to the VA. The VA will perform an evaluation. Um, they're going to uh, check to see if everything's conformant. Um, if it's not, they're going to pass it back to the supplier uh, by noting deviations, um, telling the supplier what the issues are. The supplier will then update everything and, uh, and resubmit. Now, generally speaking, we expect the supplier um, as a VA organization that the supplier is going to give preliminary versions that aren't going to pass the first couple of times just so we can make sure the documents are in the right format and that sort of stuff. So we expect to go through this loop at least once prior to getting a pass. Um, when you get a pass, then there will be a verification results package that's generated that includes a verification statement. So when that verification statement is passed to the software supplier, um, the VA also uh, stores everything in their VA retention repository. Um, now, one of the other key things on this diagram is that uh, the supplier does not pass the VA the version of the shared data model they're using. It does not pass the, uh, sorry, the supplier doesn't pass to the VA uh, the CTS. Uh, the VA always goes to the reference repository to download that stuff themselves. So let's talk about the verification, the package. Um, in that verification package, the software verification package, um, that's gonna include your statement of conformance, which we just talked about a little while ago. That's gonna include uh, your conformance verification matrix, uh, which is of course the, the listing of all the requirements of the technical standard and how you, the supplier, are answering uh, each of the requirements are, that are uh, mentioned in that uh, CBM based upon a filtering of what's in your conformance statement. The verification evidence is going to be a collection of uh, requirements, designs, test results, uh, anything that's needed for you to prove the inspection elements of the requirements that are uh, fitting your UOC based upon what's in your statement of conformance. Uh, and then you're gonna have UOC binaries for testing. And now these are compiled against the gold standard library, not executable binaries uh, reflecting your source code. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and then your data model is going to be uh, all of the communication that you pass across the transport or transport interface has to be data modeled. Uh, so for um, PSSS, uh, PCS, and transport UOCs, most transport UOCs, you'll have to provide a data model of the information that you're actually exchanging. And, and I'll go ahead and add that the uh, case conformance policy also lists uh, the verification agreement, which is an agreement between the software supplier and the VA. And, and this, this agreement is determined by the VA organization as not standardized. Um, so Chris, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say about that. No, I think that's good enough. Chris, um, I have something here. Go ahead, Rod. Um, as Chris mentioned earlier, if you're going to iterate through this and make multiple submissions and you're engaging early and often, the first iteration or the first software verification package that you may give to the VA doesn't necessarily have all of these elements. That first package may only have the statement of conformance and the conformance verification matrix, for example, because you're not far enough along in your development that you've generated all of the evidence yet. But we can still start working with you for those two things uh, as you're continuing to, to go further and further into the maturity of the development of your product. So that's why it's important to go early and often and, and not wait till you get the entire package 
but to submit smaller portions of it as we go along. And each time the package gets a little bigger and a little bigger and a little more complete until finally you're ready at the end. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Okay, so our next section is going to be talking a lot more about, you know, what is a UOC and what is it we're doing to test a UOC. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, for the most part, FACE is interested in the FACE technical standard, FACE conformance, is interested in interfaces, not performance. Um, so conformance is a lightweight process to verify that you meet the technical standard requirements. Um, we don't go and verify that you meet your requirements that you have for whatever function your UOC is supposed to be performing, just that when it comes to the FACE technical standard, uh, we verify those requirements. Um, conformance is primarily involved with those APIs, which are between segments. Uh, so the transport API, the operating system API, the iOS API, um, those are the things that we're interested in testing. And generally we do that with a link test. So we're gonna take code that was compiled that uh, doesn't have the functions that are the other side of the API, and the conformance test suite is going to test them by generating the other side and seeing if the link works. Now, when there's functional requirements in the technical standard, uh, the software supplier is actually going to test those. Um, and then you'll report in your conformance verification metrics, uh, basically where the documentation is, on how you tested it and what those test results are. Um, they may just, you may just answer some of those requirements with design documents, uh, depending on what the, um, the conformance verification matrix is calling for for each of those requirements. Uh, so the primary thing out of this is the conformance is not an indication of functional software. Conformance means that you've met the technical standard. So I liken it to kind of like a UL sticker saying, you know, I'm not gonna guarantee that the lamp lights your room, just that it's not likely to burn your house down. I guess uh, additionally, the, the conformance process doesn't impose a, a format or um, a process for how your software should be uh, be verified. But the face conformance policy doesn't impose that. that whatever your organization's uh, internal workings are for documentation can be submitted as, as evidence to, uh, for some of the stuff. And I don't know, Chris, if you want to expound on that any. Um, um, okay, go Steve. So I, I was just gonna say, we're not, we are not expecting you to write special documentation for this process. What we really are looking for as VAs is to have you point into the documentation you're already going to be writing for these things and say, here's the evidence that I met that requirement. And you know, and the same thing is true if you have to actually test something, you'll point to your test procedure and say, this is the test that we use to test this requirement, and here are the test results that say that we passed that test. Um, you're going to have to do that anyway. So in the CVM, you are just referencing and say, hey, go look in this document of ours in this section and you'll find your evidence. I'm done. Yeah, and that all goes back to that first bullet there that we're, it's meant to be a lightweight process. We're not trying to add burden uh, unless it's, it's practical uh, for meeting the goals of FACE. So we don't need you to go and generate new documents that state the same thing you need to do to meet an airworthiness goal. Um, all right, more on that in a couple of slides. Uh, let's actually go to the next slide. So one of the other things we need to think about is that because our goal is portable, reusable software, conformance to face should mean that I don't have to reconform because I ported it. So. Um, we take our source code and we build it to a target and uh, we build it to the initial target. We get all that working, we do our conformance and then somebody wants to reuse our software somewhere and we basically prove that face conformance works 
you don't have to go and redo your conformance because you ported that software somewhere else. Now, there's a couple caveats on that. Um, your source code can't have changed. Uh, and that actually feeds into the next slide, which is talking about variants. So if I have my source code, and in my source code I've got the necessary compiler switches to compile to PowerPC or to, um, to Intel-based architectures, um, if I've got in my source code the ability to turn on and off a, a bunch of optional features that I want to sell as a product line, I can take that product line source code and I can say I've got target A, which is on a PowerPC, and has my features A and E in it. I have target B, which is on an Intel processor and has the features B and C. Um, I could basically go through conformance and I could say, here's all of these variations I've got. Do my conformance program upon that initial block and then be conformant to all three of those targets that are on this slide. Now to do that, I need to properly set up my conformance statement saying here are the variants that I'm pushing through. And I need to come down to a subset of those variants that is reflective of everything that my, uh, my software could do. Um, and if you look at the possibility of say, I've got 10 options uh, and I could turn each one of those options on and off as a Boolean, that can be a hundred different uh, variants. But if I look at that and I say for all of those, if I turn all of them off, I'm executing the negative case and if I turn all of them on, I'm executing the positive case. And maybe if I just run two variants through conformance, um, I can cover all 100. Now it's on the software supplier to come up with what that subset is and prove that, uh, that they are executing all of the source code or that they are linking all of the source code with the binaries that they supply. But this allows us to think about units of conformance as these uh, portable reusable components that we want to see in the face registry. Do we have any questions on that? See, now I know everybody's just being quiet because they don't want to speak up on, in front of people. <laughs> well, let's go to the next slide. Um, so this slide, answers a lot of questions people have about why the conformance policy is the way it is. Um, if we look at the, uh, at the various entities involved, we've got the supplier, we've got the verification authority, we've got the certification authority, and then we have the registry, which is really available to everybody, right? Anybody can go and look at what's in the registry. The green lines on here represent things that the software supplier would normally produce in order to product, to create a product. And the first one is basically the description of the product. So what is my sales information? What is it that I'm gonna tell people my product is? That information actually flows through all four of these columns. When it comes to my executable product, the, the thing that actually is this product, the valuable part, um, the supplier keeps that. The verification authority never actually gets the executable version of the product. Um, and this is to pr protect that supplier IP, right? There is no entity within the FACE consortium or the FACE, e FACE ecosystem that gets access to all of the executables for every conformant product. And we can also see the source code, once again, that stays with the supplier. It does not have to be shared with anybody else. Now we have multiple verification authorities and there may be a situation where you wanna hire a verification authority to do more than just verification and you might give them the source code, but there is no requirement within the conformance program for that source code to go anywhere outside of the supplier's own servers. When it comes to your requirements, your designs, your test reports, um, when they're needed to prove conformance as verification evidence, those go to the verification authority and no further. Now there's some supplier IP in there. Um, FACE Consortium allows you to pick which 
of the verification authorities you're going to use. So once again, there is not one entity that has all of the requirements, designs, all of the IP associated with face conformance. And this is one of the reasons why a larger company may go and invest in getting their uh, SQE department uh, certified, or sorry, approved as a face VA. Now we've got a list of things which you need to do that FACE is asking you to do. Like we ask you to do a data model. Um, that data model that you produce, uh, it's the supplier produces it, they pass it to the verification authority, it goes no further. Um, that statement of conformance that you write, um, that goes to the, to the VA and then it also goes to the certification authority. So at this point, the certification authority is gonna see your product description, and how your product meets the face technical standard. Um, the verification matrix that you fill out with all of your pointers into your um, uh, verification evidence, that only goes to the VA. Um, same with the test suite configuration information. And when you build your binaries for testing, they are not executable but you buy, compile them against the gold standard library, those only go to the VA and no further. Now, when you pass verification, the, soft, the verification authority is gonna create a statement of verification. That statement of verification will go back to the supplier and it will also be provided to the, to the CA. So when the CA does their evaluation of your product, they're gonna be looking at really those three things. What's, what's your product? How does it meet face? and has it passed the verification step. Now with this structure, like I said, uh, the, the face conformance process is doing a lot to um, protect supplier IP. And it's why we're basically doing verification against source code, but we don't let anybody who's, who's verifying it actually see your source code. Um, we do a compilation to a gold standard library in order to judge uh, conformance. I, I do, I want to add one tiny thing to this. Go ahead. Um, it, it's important to note that uh, you mentioned, and this is true, the statement of verification is given to the certification authority but it is not done so until the supplier asks to have that happen. The VA does not automatically send that to the certification authority. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if that was covered in the, uh, in the business overview, but um, generally the steps through the process are all in control of the supplier. So when verification is passed, the verification authority will hand the verification, uh, the statement of verification back to the supplier. Uh, when the supplier contacts the CA to say, hey, I've passed verification, uh, the certification authority can come to the VA and say, do you have a verification certificate, or sorry, a statement of verification for this product? And the VA will either say, yes, here it is, or no. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. So a lot of times we get asked, how much is this gonna cost? And uh, the cost of the verification, that's gonna uh, basically, verification of the unit of conformance, that's gonna depend upon how big the UOC is uh, and whatever your supplier to VA relationship is. Um, since the VAs are not necessarily controlled by the consortium. I mean, they're not controlled by the consortium. They're only approved by the consortium. Um, we're not going to address cost of verification in this meeting. Um, that's really a contractual obligation between two entities um, that are not controlled by the consortium. Um, cost of face certification is fixed uh, by the certification authority. We should just put the number in here. We keep bringing it up every time. Um, it's always the same. It's agnostic of the scope of the UOC. 
nine hundred ninety five dollars. <laughs> Ron, I think you cut off on the beginning of that. Oh, nine hundred and ninety five dollars. Yeah, it, it came out as five dollars. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take two. I'll take two. <laughs> okay, so for going for conformance, there's a bunch of documents you can go and look at. Uh, the getting started guiding guide, sorry, the getting started guide. Um, you can find uh, information for that on the face landing page. Um, there's the face conformance policy. Uh, there's a conformance guide associated with the policy. There's a face conformance authorities plan that goes into what the requirements are for the VA, the CA, and the LA. Um, the technical standard, all editions, so whichever edition you're going for, um, there's a rig which comes out for each major edition. Um, there is, of course, the CVM, um, and for the CVM, there's a matrix user's guide. Um, generally, uh, most of your questions can be answered with those documents, um, or you can come to this meeting and we can answer any uh, additional questions you have. Um, of course, uh, each VA, if you contact a VA, they'll be able to uh, answer further questions as well. Um, so the software supplier statement is a conformance. Um, we talked about that one briefly. Um, the conformance verification matrix, we've got slides on that for more detail if people want to see that. Um, the statement of verification is the one that the, uh, the VA will fill out when, uh, when something passes verification. Um, all three of those documents are produced by the consortium. The conformance test suite, uh, the conformance test suite has a user's manual. Uh, those are approved by the consortium. Um, the FACE library tools includes a conformance workflow tool. Um, that's at uh, FACE software dot, somebody got the link for that? I'll find it and let you know. Yeah, I'm trying to remember if it's facesoftware.org. I think it is. Um, and I know it's in one of these slides later on. Um, so, and then the face CR, PRCR process is at ticketing.facesoftware.org. Uh, and that's where you can find uh, how you can enter new PRs and of course find the approved correction list. Um, I would recommend people to check the approved correction list before you file new CRs, of course. Um, and then, uh, let's see, the next slide here is on uh, getting into the verification authority more. So, do we have any questions overall on face conformance before we start getting into details on the verification authority? It's, this would probably also be a good opportunity if anybody wants any greater detail on anything discussed so that we can I proceed to those slides. So there's a question so, on face data models. Are face data models required for conformance? Yeah. So that once again, if you are developing something that uses the transport layer to communicate, which means something in the portable component segment or something in the platform specific segment, you will have to have data models for any communication that goes across the transport layer. That is a hard requirement of FACE. If you're well, producing a transport well, service. Okay, that's where I was going. At the transport service? Yes. Yeah, if you're providing a transport service and you're providing the type specific interface, you will have to have a data model for the things that are on the type specific interface. There's a recent CR, a recent approved correction out there that allows you to provide a way of generating new types for your transport. But even then, you need to provide a model for the types that you proved your transport with. Um, the, the, uh, there are elements or sub UOCs you could build within the transport service that don't actually provide the type specific interface and those you may not have to provide a model for. Okay, so let's talk about the face verification authority a little bit more. Um, 
So the verification authority provides an evaluation of conformance to the standard, as we talked about earlier. Um, they can also provide guidance to the software supplier on conformance-related topics. So the, soft, the, the VA can help prepare the software verification package. It's not required that they help prepare it. Um, and when it is prepared, it is the uh, property of the software supplier. Um, but the VA can help do that. The VA can also help uh, complete any of the forms. They can help you fill out the, the um, segment of conformance. They can help you fill out uh, the, the workflow tool. Um, they can trace the requirements to the verification evidence. Now, I know that if you come to some of the VAs, they're gonna charge a lot more if you ask them to do these services, um, but there's nothing that stops the VA from offering those services. It's not required that they do it, but they can do it as additional value. Um, we can, or the VA can also help you compile to the test suite, but they must be independent from uh, writing your requirements and designing or developing your software. Um, so this is a standard uh, independence um, practice. Um, as we said, the current contact information for finding a VA is on the landing page under the conformance topic. So if you want to look for a VA, that's where you go. Um, so in order to promote a common approach to verification, all of the verification authorities that are approved are automatically members of uh, the FACE Verification Authority Community of Practice, the VACOP. Um, organizations wanting to be a VA and ready to perform the task can apply. Uh, there's no limit on the number of VAs that can be approved. Uh, the RFP is at this link, um, and uh, we have a how to become a VA set of slides, which we'll be going through in a little bit. Uh, so this is going to start answering some of the VA questions from earlier. And yes, the slides will be posted later, and um, the Actually, I'm pretty sure we, we post these slides, right, Robert? I know they're on the CBM uh, page on Plato. And, and uh, we are recording this meeting. Yeah, if you give me give give me a second, I will I'll leave these this, this view up and go find the uh, the link to the slides and post it in the chat. Okay. Uh, Chris, we we have a couple questions, just uh, or maybe it's just one question. One one was about the slides. Um, so this one says, when did the technical standards change? How will upgrades to the conformance or how does it affect conformance? Um, and will the VA perform evaluation against only the gaps? I guess this is this may be hitting, trying to hit on recertification. Delta search. So, right, so um, the, the primary thing here is that verification is to one edition of the standard. So if you were conformant to edition 2.0 of the technical standard and edition 2.1 came out, you don't have to do anything. You're conformant to 2.0. If you want to be conformant to 2.1, you have to go through and run conformance again for the new edition of the standard. Um, if there are a number of approved corrections that went through the PRCR process, so if you were working on phase 2.1, and there are PRs that came out that led to phase 2.1.1, um, you're conformant to technical standard 2.1. The CRs, the approved corrections that came out against 2.1, they don't have to apply to your software for you to be conformant. So there's no redo. There's no, if the technical standard changes, do you automatically progress forward? Um, any time that you want to say, I'm conformant to a different edition of the technical standard, it's a new run through the process. Now we can go back to that cost question. How much does this cost? Um, your new certificate, certificate from the conformance uh, authority is going to be that 995. Every time you get a new certificate, it's the same price. Um, the cost for your VA to go through and do uh, whatever changes you made to go to that new edition really just depends upon your contractual relationship with that VA. Um, 
theoretically, it's going to be a whole lot cheaper if all you do is change a couple of things and you've already done your verification to a previous edition. So uh, does that answer your question? So I, I would like to add also, um, it, it, as an example, we have uh, 211 that's out and 31 and 30 that's out. If you've written a UOC that, you know, you can configure to run with any of those, then you could do that as a variant and say, we support these three different versions with the same piece of software. So that's another possibility. But as far as something new coming out after you've written your software and gone through conformance, I'd have to agree with Chris. You'd, you would have to go through the process again. Unless perchance you didn't have to change any source code. Now you'd still have to go through the process again. Yeah, your, your conformance statement says what edition it's for. Right. You can't change that after you did your conformance. You cannot change that. But you may not have to make any modifications either. So it all depends on, you know, what your UOC is designed for. Okay, does anybody have any other questions before we get into the how do you be a VA? All right, um, before I get too far into this, I do want to do well, one quick. I was going to say there, there is one one other thing that we could do um, before we, you know, go into how to be a VA, and that is, you know, we have a, a whole bunch of slides. We could just show them the list of topics and see if it spurs any questions. Um, well, I... It just may be something someone hasn't thought of yet. Just an idea. Well, let, let's just... But I, okay, we've got a question, how many VAs are there? There are currently four. Um, before I get into this next set of slides, uh, I see Brendan's on. Hey, Brendan, when, I know that there's a new RFP coming out, which is going to affect these slides. Do we have an idea as to how, how far we are away from that happening? Hey, Chris, can you hear me? Yep. Um, it is out for BWG review. So I would say definitely by, I think we shoot for the December face-to-face, -face, but by the end of the year for sure, if not before that. Okay. And it's not changing this a whole lot, right? We're just making some uh, fine adjustments. Um, but the reason I'm bringing that up is that if you're applying to be a VA, what we're going to go through is the process today. Um, and by the end of the year, there may be updates that are going to change what goes into these slides. Yeah, I, yeah, I would agree with that. And I think the, the changes were to address some fairly specific um, issues from, from before. Right. Um, and, and Steve, to your point, um, there, and, and really when we post these slides and we make these slides available, everybody, um, one thing you have to be aware of is that these slides are really kind of everything after the first 20, they're kind of draft, uh, they're really meant to spur conversation. Um, so there's a lot of things in here that may not be fully fleshed out when you're going through and reviewing them. Um, I know that the, uh, um, Let's see. I can just go through the list of sections that um, that we haven't covered. Um, we have a section on the conformance workflow tool on when you go to the website to work through the conformance. Um, we have a section on the face registry and what that looks like. Um, we did the statement of conformance slides. Um, there are slides on the conformance verification matrix. Um, there's a slide on what verification evidence is, uh, a little bit about the binaries, um, when you compile against the gold standard library. Um, there's some slides upon using the conformance test suite. There's some slides upon the data model. Um, there's slides about the approved correction workflow, uh, the PRCR process, the verification statement, um, and I think 
we'll actually back up to slide 72 and do the VACOP real quick. Um, so if any of those topics I went through, if anybody's got int interest in seeing the detailed slides in those topics, just post it in the chat. Um, and we're gonna start getting into a bit more about uh, the VA. Okay, so the Verification Authority Community of Practice is led by the Conformance Verification Matrix Subcommittee. That's um, the team that uh, Robert and I lead. Um, we can provide the charter for anybody who wants to see it. Uh, the primary um, goal here is for documenting known issues or common issues in a knowledge base. So the VAs get together, they discuss things, they create a knowledge base. Uh, yeah, this is another set of slides that we do need to update because um, the approved guidance is basically fed back to the CVM and the, um, the VACOP doesn't actually publish anything to the public. Um, there is a knowledge center that's restricted only to VAs and the guided discussions are moderated by the CVM team and they're only open to VAs. Um, the VACOP uh, liability no. to the consortium is that we will provide the attendance We're records and that's... Become 4586 knowledgeable and help... Uh, somebody is not on mute. Overwatch to 4586 VSM. Thanks. So um, basically those discussions are private to the VAs. Uh, that allows the VAs to feel comfortable talking about issues. And if the VAs are talking about something, um, it, it may not be uh, really, um, I'm trying to find the right words here. Uh, it's not necessarily for public consumption um, as they try to figure out exactly what the right thing to do is um, they'll feed it through the CVM team. The CVM team will reach out to the technical working group and we'll figure out what the right answer is without telling anybody what the interim solutions are. Um, so those, those CO, VA COP meetings are, are meant to be uh, private and just for the VAs. Next slide. And, 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 uh, well, I'll, I'll let you finish and then if it's not covered, I'll, I'll say something. Can I add okay. something there? Uh, I think it's important to, to note that even when one VA is talking to another VA, we still have the responsibility of protecting the IP of our supplier. So we, even if we're discussing how do we verify this or that, we would not use as an example uh, uh, something from one of our suppliers that had not been sanitized in such a way that it wouldn't provide information uh, to someone outside of our VA uh, to, um, to give them information about a supplier. So even within that kind of setting, the intellectual property is protected. Thanks, Ron. So the VACOP, um, they do discussions through WebEx uh, and uh, through a web discussion board. Um, resolved discussions are added to the knowledge base. Um, the VACOP has the contact information for the various members of the COP available. Um, during face-to-face -face meetings, when we have face-to-face -face meetings, um, the VA generally meet on the first day, um, which is likely a Tuesday. We might meet for two hours. Um, VAs are not required to attend all of the meetings. They're not required to attend all of face-to-face -face meetings. Um, we don't want to, to raise the cost of verification by requiring that sort of stuff. Uh, and those meetings are once again for VA COP members only. Um, VAs who are not members of the FACE Consortium will only be invited to those meetings and not other consortium events. Um, at this point, we don't actually have any VAs that are not members of the consortium. Um, the occasional WebEx on topics, um, we're actually meeting uh, regularly on WebEx at, these, at this point. Uh, and then there can also be uh, private help desk discussions with the VA to CVM team um, when there's things that, uh, that 
may not uh, be fitting for even the general VACOP conversations. Um, next slide. So generally speaking, the VACOP, um, we're going to talk about uh, immediately talking about any approved corrections that come out, um, any clarifications on what's in the verification matrix, uh, test suite usage, um, when normative references within the, uh, exist within the technical standard, and there are a lot of normal normative references in the technical standard. Um, you know, what, what concerns there are associated with those, uh, the general business practices and concerns, uh, the for the record test concerns, um, if you have to witness a, tech, a test, if you are conducting a test, um, reproducing the test, uh, and potential PRs to consor conformance consortium documents, test suites. Um, if a supplier has an issue that doesn't work, uh, the VA may bring that to the VACOP to discuss whether or not that needs to be a CR. Um, those are the kinds of things that uh, the VACOP discusses. All right, so let's get into the application process. Okay, before you do, I want to add one last thing. So one, one of the other purposes of the VACOP is to help maintain consistency amongst the VAs. So if there's ever any question about, well, you know, if I go to this VA, are they going to uh, evaluate something the same as that VA? The answer is yes, and the COP is, is there to help make sure that that happens. This is how we coordinate. Yeah, that's actually the primary purpose for the COP, is to make it so that there is not a, um, a huge discrepancy in the way that VAs are evaluating product, and to ensure that uh, everybody who's approved to be a VA, that we can communicate uh, changes and um, other things in a way that uh, we are all doing things in a similar manner. Now, that's not saying that there aren't uh, advantages in individual VA's processes, but the evaluations themselves should be consistent. Okay, so um, you want to be a VA. Um, so we're going to go through what the VA's responsibilities are, who can apply, how do you apply, what the approval process is, uh, what's in that RFP that you have to respond to, um, how that response is being evaluated, and what exactly are the 14 items that you need to cover in your response. So as we talked about earlier, the VA serves as a technical evaluation, technical evaluation of conformance to the face technical standard. Um, so you're going to evaluate the submitted products through test suite execution and inspection of artifacts. You have to be an expert because you are the final verification of the, the technical aspects of these UOCs. Um, this is all outlined in the face conformance policy and the face conformance authorities plan. Um, so in those same two documents, uh, to prevent checking your work, you have to be organizationally independent from the development and integration of face software or face conformance software. Um, VAs do not have to be consortium members, but they do need to be technical, technically informed on the technical standards. So um, if you're not a member of the consortium, you're going to have to find a way to prove how you know uh, the technical standard well enough to be a VA. Um, there is an RFP that's currently out there at uh, opengroup.org slash face slash face VA. Uh, that's got the the um, the, the uh, RFP, which we're going to go through here in a bit. And uh, you basically write a response and you send that to ogfaceadmin at opengroup.org. Um, let's go to the next slide. So according to the Conformance Authorities Plan, any responses to the RFP are going to be reviewed by the VA Approval Committee. committee. The VA Approval Committee is likely to respond with questions or a request for an improved response. 
Um, once they're satisfied that the response has met the qualifications, they will make a recommendation to the steering committee and the steering committee will vote to approve or deny the application. So this basically means that the VA, the, the VA approval committee is not going to tell you no, they're not gonna fail you. They're just gonna ask you to improve your response. Um, and when you get a response that is sufficient, then uh, you'll be um, uh, voted on by the steering committee. So um, we're gonna go through the RFP and a little bit more. Is there any questions so far? Okay. So uh, the RFP is currently structured in four sections. I believe the new one is gonna have the same four sections. Um, there's an introduction. There's a description of what the verification authority is. Um, section three is basically instructions. And section four is the description on how you're going to be evaluated. The approval committee, when they get the response, is going to evaluate the response using only the response against the criteria in the RFP. So basically they're going to look at section four of the RFP and your response, and that's what they're going to judge you on. The recommendation is that you read the criteria carefully when you prepare your response. The approval committee can use the entire response as an evaluation of your overall capability to meet the duties of the VA. So if you write something in the, the uh, introduction, um, the VA can use part of that as their evaluation, as well as when you answer each of the 14 elements. Um, so respondents should prepare a professional, complete, consistent, and accurate response. The VA approval committee cannot judge a candidate based upon reputation or knowledge outside of that response. So don't rely upon name recognition, your company, your individuals, um, any of that kind of stuff has to be in the response to be used. Um, relevant work accomplished should be reflected in the response. Hey Chris, quick question, uh, what's an RFP? A request for a proposal. All right, so in section three, there are 14 items. In section four, there are, there are the evaluation criteria for those 14 items. So in each of these, these next slides, we're gonna list what the item is that's in section three and what the, um, what the evaluation criteria is in section four. So the first one, uh, VA's got to be able to, answer, to access the face reference repository. So briefly describe how your organization accesses the reference repository. Uh, and that's basically your ability to access bookstore at opengroup.com, more or less. Um, number two, describe how your VA will ensure independence from software development, software integration uh, activities of your overall organization. So either your enterprise doesn't perform software development or integration, or your personnel report to a management structure that does not direct the development of software products or integration of those products. Um, number three is describe how your personnel within your organization have demonstrable knowledge of the technical standard and its normative references. Note the face technical standard has a large number of normative references listed in section two. So either your team members have been involved in the development and or review of the technical standard, or they've documented completion of organic third-party training curriculum, uh, or uh, you've got experience with face technical standard standard references and its ecosystems. So you have to prov provide one of those three things. Um, number four is describe how you plan to maintain that knowledge. Now, a plan can either be uh, an outline of an intended plan to a fully released process. Uh, the response just describes it, doesn't, or has to describe it, just can't just name it. Um, and in this case, you both need a training plan for new employees and a plan for learning new standards as they're published.
So uh, there are verification techniques that are listed in the CVM. Um, describe how your personnel have demonst demonstrable knowledge of the verification techniques. Uh, this can be through documented past experience showing developmental or technical review of software and test procedures. Um, number six, describe how your personnel within your VA organization have knowledge of the face conformance test suite. And once again, the same kind of, uh, you know, you've been involved in the development or review of the test suite, or you've completed third party training curriculum. Um, number seven is how do you maintain knowledge of that test suite? So once again, um, a training plan for new employees and a plan for uh, learning new additions as the new additions are released. Number eight is describe your organization's process credentials for or methods for developing and adhering to well-defined processes. So do you have AS9100? Do you have ISO 9000, CMMI? Um, if you don't have those, do you have an organizational policy and historical evidence of adherence to well-defined processes? Um, how can you prove to the FACE consortium that you can follow a process? Um, number nine is describe your processes for configuration control. So uh, your method must cover, uh, you know, recording equipment, serial numbers, software versions, um, all of that kind of stuff. So number 10 is describe your plan to conduct or witness for the record testing. Your plan must include configuration of the test environment, um, methodologies for capturing and storing results, recording the test personnel involved, all of that. Um, number 11, uh, your skills and abilities to objectively assess submitted verification evidence to detect and communicate deficiencies or omissions. So here we're looking for past history of reviewing design requirements, test procedures, test reports, methods for detecting a complete or inaccurate traces, and a plan for communicating deficiencies. So number 12 gets to that uh, supplier IP. So how does your, what's your plan to enforce policies and, policies and procedures that ensure protection of supplier IP? Now, existence of policies and procedures to generate and honor non-disclosure agreements, hold substantial materials and confidence, um, that kind of information. Number 13 is your plan to protect confidential, confidentiality of all information on applicants and applications. Um, this is different than IP because this is getting to the fact that uh, just the idea that a supplier is coming to a VA could be considered confidential um, and not for public knowledge. So uh, your plan must treat all communications with suppliers as sensitive as required by suppliers, including the names of the projects and project schedules. And lastly, number 14, uh, describe your policies and procedures within your organization for establishing and maintaining a verification retention repository um, in accordance to the face documents and requirements. Uh, so this plan must include the storage of the verification statements, conformance statement, um, digital signatures, and sufficient reports <coughs> and digital signatures, by the way, is one of the things that's being removed in the new version uh, because that was removed from the uh, conformance policy uh, several years ago. So, um, so are you seeing the question? Yeah, the, so a VA can be a company or an organization within a company or an organization within a, um, a branch of the military. So we currently have uh, 
the Army uh, Verification Authority is being uh, handled by Army Futures Command under S3I, uh, CCDC Emmerdeck. Um, the Navy is under, um, I forget which PMA that is. Um, and then we have um, Tucson Embedded Systems SAVI, um, which is related to Tucson Embedded Systems. And, um, and then we have Scient as the current organizations. But yes, it's possible for uh, an SQE organization from one of the major suppliers to also be a verification authority. Okay, so the slide that we've got up here, um, this is a list of all the documents that uh, you may want to go through if you're planning on applying to be a BA. Um, the COP best practices uh, is not published and won't be, so that's one of the things we need to remove from the slide. So the last slide in our deck is the more information slide. Um, these are contacts that you can reach out to um, if you have more questions. And of course, uh, we're gonna say if you've got more and you show up for the next face-to-face, -face, you can always join this meeting again and ask questions. Um, usually we get a lot of them. And, and I know this meeting goes a lot better when we're sitting in a room and uh, able to discuss things more freely. And with that, I'm happy to end us at an hour and a half if, uh, if there are no further questions. All right, everybody, thanks for joining.